we came up with is a document called the Open Source Definition. It's derived from the Debian Free Software Guidelines that were originally written by Bruce Perrins. I had written the original draft of that, uh, discussed it for a month with the Debian developers. Debian is a Linux distribution and made it their project policy. And Eric and I decided to relabel what we'd written for Debian as the open source definition and to say open source is software that gives you a list of nine rights, which is in the open source definition. The first right is free redistribution. This doesn't mean free as in no price, it means liberty. Um, you have to be free to redistribute your software to someone else. And actually, no price is a side effect. You can charge for that redistribution or not. It has to come with source code so that someone can maintain a program. If they go from a PC to a Mac, for example, they can change the software. Derived works have to be possible. If someone has to improve your program, um, they should be able to distribute the result. Uh, there's a provision about integrity of the author source code, which says that the author can sort of maintain their honor, and if you make a change, you might have to change the name of the program or mark out your change very clearly so that your change doesn't reflect on the author. There is no discrimination against people or groups. Uh, the example I usually use is you can't stop an abortion clinic or an anti-abortion activist from using the software. Uh, there's no discrimination against fields of endeavor, and that means the software has to be usable in a business as well as in a school. The license has to be distributable, in other words, um, I have to be able to give that license to someone and that license then should work if that someone gives it to yet a third person. Uh, the license can't be specific to a product. In other words, if I um, distribute my software on a Red Hat system, the license can't say you can't distribute this on a SUSE or a Debian system. The license can't contaminate other software, so if I distribute this on a CD with another program, it can't say that other program must be free, otherwise you can't distribute my software. Uh, and then the only other part of the open source definition is a list of licenses that were accepted. And the ones that we started with were the GPL, which was actually the example for a lot of what's in the open source definition, the BSD license, because software for BSD system pre-existed Linux. Uh, I, I think uh, the next moment that I thought was really pivotal was when the database vendors flipped over, which happened about three months sooner than I expected it to. It actually happened in, in late July, early August. That Who we were they? Commitments to do tier one ports from Oracle and, and Sybase and the other key database vendors. And why was that critical? Because we knew that in order for the open source story to be credible, and especially in order for the Linux story to be credible, we'd have to get commitments from independent software vendors to do ports of their applications to these platforms. And I was actually kind of worried. I, I, I felt that we were in a window of vulnerability between the time that uh, we announced the open source campaign and the database vendors flipped over. That was the point at which hostile action by, by Microsoft or other closed source software companies, that was the point at which a serious marketing blitz might actually have sunk us. But once the da big database vendors flipped over, that opened the way for other ISVs. That started a snowball effect going. Every six months or so, I would come back to the venture capitalists and I would show them the new numbers showing more and more people adopting Linux, the new people porting, the new users, and I'd show them our customer list. And our customer list was getting much more impressive. It was people like Cisco that were beginning to appear. People like, the, you know, the dot-com companies were starting to show up on our, our customer list. And eventually the venture capitalists, uh, you know, they kept looking at it and they kept saying, oh, we can't quite do it. Finally, Linus appeared on the cover of Fortune because there was something happening with open source. Well, at that point, the, the venture capitalists couldn't ignore it. They just got sick of hearing about Linux everywhere, and they got tired of me just you know, showing it to them every, every 
at that point almost almost every week. So they, uh, they decided it was time to invest, that there was something happening. Well, I announced open source to the world on the internet. I did a lot of the early administrative work of starting the open source initiative. And I think six months later, I was reading the words open source in the news all the time and was totally astounded. And a year later, I believe Microsoft was talking about releasing some source code. And someone in the press asked Steve Ballmer if they were going to open source their code. And Steve Ballmer said, well, open source means more than just releasing the source code. And I realized that he had read my document and understood it and was now telling the press about this. Now, if you're like just a guy on the net who's not doing this for a job at all, and you sort of write a manifesto, and it spreads out through the world, and a year later, the vice president of Microsoft is talking about that, you'd think you were on drugs, wouldn't you? But that's what really happened. <laughs> The local users groups tend to be more an issue of uh, building a social network, uh, especially getting people familiarized with the issues, uh, also just acting as a kind of s support network for, for people who, who do not, for example, have the ability to pay for, for a commercial support network. So one thing they're doing in this area, for example, is they're making these, I think it's once a month, they're having install fests, which means that people who have problems getting Linux installed on their machine or have some issue, I mean, maybe they've actually installed Linux but want to set up the network in a specific way, can actually bring in their machines to this users group meeting. And there's a lot of people there willing to help who've maybe seen that problem before. Well, actually, things aren't going so well. I tried it earlier myself. Uh, I had problems, and so I came to this install fest where all the gurus abound. Hopefully, I'll uh, have better luck getting it in. Instead of having uh, sending emails or writing to news groups on the internet and waiting several days for the answer sometimes, it's easy to come here and find other people who might know about your problem and maybe able to help you. And hopefully within a few hours you have your machine installed. Originally I wanted to install on uh, my larger laptop and so I just did a search on the net and found where uh, there were resources to get help. And um, I'm here today because I'm trying to put Linux on this little guy right here, which is a Toshiba libretto. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to do because it's a weird piece of hardware. So, are there any chairs around here? I think the Department of Justice case has made people aware of the fact that you should at least look for alternatives to Microsoft and maybe Microsoft isn't the American dream after all. And that kind of shift in perception, uh, you can very clearly see that people just took Microsoft for granted and maybe they're still buying Microsoft but at least they're kind of more aware of the issue these days. Microsoft actually used Linux's defense. They used Linux to ground a claim that they don't have a monopoly because Linux could um, essentially push them off their catbird seat at any time. It's a very ingenious argument, totally specious, because it didn't, uh, it didn't do anything to answer the charge that they had previously engaged in bullying and various anti-competitive practices, but it was clever of them. In, in an event, the, the, the judge didn't buy it. Well, ordinarily, we in the Linux community are rather wary about letting Microsoft become the issue. But uh, there was a Slashdot article uh, about December of 98 where uh, a fellow named Matt at uh, the Noodle had pointed out that the, the, a gentleman in Australia had managed to receive a refund for the unused copy of Windows that came with his computer. So he declared uh, the 19th of January, was it January? 
Uh, no, it's February. February. I'm sorry. The 19th of February. He declared the 19th of February Windows Refund Day, and he encouraged everyone to go to their computer manufacturers and return their unused copies of Windows 